I hope you're enjoying the talks. Uh, as I said, we're just over the halfway mark, so plenty more uh, to open your eyes and mind throughout the course of the remainder of proceedings. Um, and again, if, you are, uh, if you've got something to share, please do so by tweeting us on the QR code that is on that uh, sheet or that piece of paper uh, in front of you. When you came in, the QR code allows you to interact with us. Do use the hashtags and the handles throughout. Okay, onwards, friends, as we move on to the next uh, of our presentations. This is a fireside chat for you, bringing digital service gaps in government to life. So we were going to be uh, introducing to you a, a man who's been recognised the world over, in fact, twice been named one of Apolitical's mo world's 100 most influential people in digital government. To make that introduction and give us a bit of background as to how privileged we are to have him here, moderating this one is the co-founder of the Canadian Digital Service and the CEO of Think Digital. Please welcome to make the presentations, Ryan Androsoff. Thanks so much, and uh, really a pleasure to be with you here in Dubai. Um, my name is Ryan Androsoff. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Think Digital, um, and I'm really honored to be able to share the stage today with, uh, with Aaron Snow. Uh, just a little bit of context before I bring Aaron up. Um, I used to work with the Canadian government, with our national government in Ottawa, um, and back in 2016, 2017, we embarked on a process to create a new digital services team, the Canadian Digital Service. And when we launched that team, we embarked on a international search to bring in someone to lead and take over the chief executive officer role for the Canadian Digital Service. And I think the Canadian government benefited greatly from Aaron Snow being the successful candidate who came up. Aaron had previously been leading 18F, which was the US government's digital team, came up to Canada and helped to kickstart the efforts with our Canadian digital services team. And today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about some of the, the interesting challenges and opportunities around improving digital services. So Aaron, please come up and join me for a conversation. So, Aaron, the, the title of our fireside chat today is Bridging the Gap for Digital Services. And I thought it would be a helpful way to start the conversation by actually kind of defining some of those terms and what we mean by that. And so let's start with digital services. You know, when we talk, I mean, it can be a little bit of a buzzword sometimes. When, when, when I say digital services, what does that mean to you? Great. Hi, folks, and thank you for having me. Um, uh, and thanks for accommodating. Um, uh, digital services. Well, um, this is where we, we're already going to start to get really nerdy here. Um, I think when, when people, folks hear a phrase like digital services, they think about technology. They think about stuff that's cool. Um, digital services to us is really um, just about meeting modern expectations in service. And, and that, that implies not just technology, but it implies applying culture and processes and practices and understandings that reach way beyond. As, as several previous speakers have alluded to, it's usually not just about the technology, it's much more about the people. Absolutely. No, I, I think it's an incredibly important point, and as you said, it's been a theme, I think, throughout the afternoon, a number of the presentations that have come up. So, in our title for the talk, we also talk about gaps, you know, this implication that there are gaps right now with a lot of governments around the world, I, I dare say probably every public administration around the world is facing some gaps. What in your mind are kind of those big gaps, you know, um, that governments are facing in terms of those expectations from citizens? So. Uh I, let's look at this through the lens of a, of a, a massive failure of digital service delivery. <laughs> um, in 2013, I was in the Obama administration uh, uh, as a fellow, and three months into my six-month term there, which would turn into a four-year term, uh, um, the government tried to launch uh, healthcare.gov, right? Fundamentally a terrific idea with a snappy name. Um, we're going to provide a website where you go, you click, you sign up, you get healthcare, which is something that millions and millions of Americans did not have and could not do easily. Um, on the day of the launch, October 1st, it was meant to serve many, many millions of people. That first day, it served eight. Um, and, and this is where, so, so let's talk about expectations, let's talk about the gaps. I think there are like four gaps that we can talk about. 
number one, there's the expectations gap. <laughs> and the expectations gap right there for the end user was the difference for millions of people between being able to sign up and going and getting a, you know, a 404 error or some other kind of error and not being able to sign up and get a service they, they very much needed. Um, now, so that, that's the end of the path. So what other gaps are there? So there's the technology gap. <laughs> um, you know, this was one of many examples, this has been one of many examples around the world of government technology not meeting expectations. <clears throat> um, government has a hard time with technology sometimes. Um, uh, many governments uh, have legacy systems, so-called legacy systems. Uh, they spend a lot of time and money trying to replace the legacy systems. As often as not, those systems end up getting replaced with new legacy systems, <laughs> which, which leave us with some of the same problems. Um, so then let's move on to the third gap, which is that even if, even if you can get some of the technology well, in order, in order to get the technology right, what do you need? You need capabilities. And so there's, there is also a capabilities gap in many governments. Um, not nearly enough governments have the kind of expertise that they need in software, that is, in development, in design, as His Excellency pointed out earlier, um, in research, in product, in basic understanding of how to deliver services through software in the modern age. Um, and that's a struggle that many governments have, in part because uh, the, the market for those experts is very competitive. Um, government is not necessarily always seen as a top-tier destination for folks who are good at that stuff. Um, it takes time and energy and focus to grow that talent internally to government. Um, and, and, and folks can say, all right, well, let's turn to the private sector. But uh, even, even if you're going to turn to the private sector for that kind of talent and expertise to do most of the work, if you don't have some of that expertise in-house in government, then government becomes a, a, a buyer at, on the wrong end of, a, of an imbalanced negotiation. Um, if you're not a savvy, smart buyer, I mean, I know nothing about how my car works. When I take my car to get repaired, I have to trust that the people I'm talking to are gonna give me a, a fair shake, a real answer, a fair price. Uh, Sometimes maybe they're not. I have no way of knowing. Now multiply that by several orders of magnitude and you get a sense for what can happen in government sometimes. Now, even if you can get capabilities built up in government, you have more, another gap, which is a structure and incentives gap. So you can bring terrific people into government, you can train up people in government on the skills and expertise they need. If they're not empowered and enabled in their context, they will still fail and probably, by the way, leave. Um, and, and governments, many of them, are you know, traditionally hierarchical, siloed. Uh, uh, delivering modern, modern software uh, is fu fundamentally a cross-functional exercise. Um, and government, government culture is classically very risk averse. And building modern software is about designing but also learning from what, what you, what's working and what's not, learning from failures and pivoting quickly, iterating, as we say. Um, and so you have a, a whole set of structural incentives that work against that in many cases in many environments. Yeah, I, I think fascinating. And, and you know, I, I, I like kind of the structure of those four gaps that you've laid out. So I guess the question becomes then, what do we do about that, right? How do we, how do we bridge that gap? And, and obviously one approach that has been taken um, over the last decade and a half has been the creation of what people call digital services teams, right? The UK government had one of the first back in 2011, the Government Digital Service, 18F, the organization you led in the US, as you mentioned, was created you know, in the early you know, 2010s. We had the Canadian Digital Service. I'm wondering if you could maybe, you know, for yourself, having, I think, uniquely been a leader in two of these different digital services teams on both sides of the Canada-US border, be interested in your reflections on, you know, what are these digital services teams able to do effectively to solve those gaps? Where are they maybe not fit for purpose? Um, and the other question with an international audience watching this today, does every government need to have a digital services team like that? Is it an essential ingredient to being able to kind of solve that digital services gap? So we used to joke at ATNF that uh, a digital service team is a change management team disguised as tech help. Um, and, and, and that's 
because, uh, you know, as we talk about those layers of gaps, um, what we inevitably would find was the technology is not usually the hard part. Yeah, there are tech problems, and some of them are deep. We can put expertise on those problems, but the incentives and structures and how people work were the important part. So yes, digital service teams can, the United States Digital Service uh, was born out of healthcare.gov as well, and, and they, you know, crisis response is an expertise they developed. And, and many, many digital service teams do crisis response. They can build software, they can build platforms for government. Um, but the, the most important function I think they serve is to be a risk absorber to say things that folks, that, that dedicated, skilled, smart, talented public servants who have been toiling for a long time in difficult environments may not be able to say because the incentives are all aligned against them speaking up about what really needs to change and, and structural change in government is very, very difficult to execute for lots of reasons. So, Having someone else who can come in and say what needs to be said, point out what needs to be pointed out, um, can, can oftentimes give people permission um, to think and work differently than they ever have. And that's really the key. If, it, you know, government, government organizations need to be able, they need, they need that permission to think differently and to work differently and to try things and try things that might fail sometimes um, without you know, losing their jobs over it uh, if, if they're gonna keep up with a very fast changing world and all that comes with it. Yeah, no, I, I think that, that's helpful insight around it. So you know, as we look to the future, right, and as, as, as we kind of close off this conversation, um, I often kind of think about the, the evolution of the, what I'll call the digital government movement and being kind of three phases, right? You go back to the 1990s, the early days of the web, it's kind of what we called e-government, you know, people, governments were putting information online for the first time. We had the, the web 2.0 revolution in the mid-2000s, what people were calling government 2.0, very much about social media. We've now kind of moved into this digital government era which, as we've been talking about, has been characterized by these digital services teams trying to inject some of this expertise into government. What do you think looking forward, because very much the conversations here today and at the summit over the last couple of days have been about looking to the future. If you think about, you know, five to ten years horizon coming down the pipe, you know, what do you think the big challenges are? What do you think the big opportunities are for being able to close that gap around digital services and citizen expectations? Um, one of my former colleagues, Sid Harrell, calls this a decades-long project. Uh, she thinks that you know digital service revolution is going to take you know on the order of 50 years. I think she's right. Um, there are governments that are doing this well. Governments that are doing it less well. Uh, you know, it's a big world with hundreds of thousands of governments: national, provincial, state, local, territorial, what have you. Um, I, I think w one thing that is clear is that crises seem to spur digital transformation in a way that is extremely healthy. Um, that, you, know, uh, you know, the most obvious example right now is Ukraine, which first reacting to p the pandemic and then to war, has been moving ahead with the digitalization of their government at light speed, in, in just busting through barriers and, and they are quickly becoming one of the preeminent digital governments of the world. Um, Back in, in Canada, uh, I worked on a project, well, my team worked on a project uh, to try and, uh, uh, before the pandemic, to try and modernize a disability benefit that was taking three, four months and more just, just to get applicants an answer on whether or not they were gonna be able to receive the benefit. And, and we were struggling a lot with every layer of bureaucracy and compliance and policy and habit and culture and all of that stuff. Then the pandemic hits, and in, the matter of, in a matter of one month, the Canadian government decides and then actually operationalizes, sending billions and billions of dollars to tens of millions of Canadians uh, for emergency relief benefit. Now, what changed? It, it, it wasn't that one was easy and one was hard. It was that the risk calculus was entirely different in the moment when we could set aside a lot of the cruft that might otherwise get in our way. And so the question in my mind is, how do you recreate 
a crisis without actually having a crisis? How do you recreate those conditions so that government can think about how to modernize and all that it entails structurally and incentives-wise in addition to the capabilities and the technology and expectation setting? Because um, I think that that's going to be the question. Yep. And, and, and how governments, whether and how governments make progress on that in the next five to ten years, I think that's in the hands of all the people in this room. Yeah. No, I think it's a great call to action to, to close us off. Aaron, a pleasure as always. Fascinating conversation. Great to see you again. Thanks, Thanks so much. Ryan.